Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Murder Journal. It's Mel and Tommy. And this is book one, where we talk about serial killers. But we need a definition. So, Tommy, what exactly is a serial killer? It says FBI defines serial killer or serial killing as a series of two or more murders committed by separate events, usually but not always by one offender acting alone. And it can have two. To okay. be classified as a serial killer, there must be at least three different murder events at three different locations with a cooling off period between each event. It That's th okay. And I see why they said the separate events, because if it was just like all at one time, that would be a mass murderer, right? Mm -hmm. So if okay. I like killed someone right now and then went to Burger King, killed somebody again, and then went to Burger King, that's still mass. That's not a cooling yeah. off period, it's even though it's an hour between. Or, right. you know, 30 seconds, 30 mm -hmm. minutes between, it's not classified. So it'd be like, you know, like a weekly thing or okay. every other day. Okay. Got it. Well, unfortunately, I found what I believe the worst of the worst. Now, I'm going to warn you guys, it is, it's graphic. It's, it's definitely not for young viewers. Uh, you might want to you know, watch something else. Oh, and another thing I found with that FBI lookup, because, you know, going to FBI.gov, they call them geniuses. The way that they're so hard to detect and uh, the patterns and stuff like that, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it throws them. Right. Well, I'm about to bring you the worst of the worst. So buckle up. We're going to talk about Pedro Alonso Lopez. They call him the monster of the Andes. Right off the bat, I will tell you, when I first heard of his crimes, Tommy, I was so disgusted. And not just at him and his actions, but how easy it was for him to kill. So who is Pedro Alonso Lopez. He is, I think, probably the most prolific serial killer in modern history, for sure. Have you even heard of him, uh, Tommy? Nope. Well, this guy, th this guy is, is the epitome of a douche canoe. This was his mugshot from when he finally did go to prison. Now, here we go. So... He was born October 8th, 1948, which would make him 75 years old by today. And he was born in Santa Isabel, Colombia. And his father actually was part of the country's right wing. His name was Medardo Reyes. And his father got in an argument with his wife in sometime in December, left the house, hired a prostitute named... Benilda Lopez de Castaneda, and obviously slept with her. She got knocked up. But six months before Pedro was born, his father was murdered by a rebellious mob. Lopez is the seventh out of 13 children. His mother was violent, according to him. She was very abusive to him, as was her clients. And when he was eight years old, his mom caught him essaying his little sister. So she kicked him out of the house. Not like the kind where you're punished, you go outside and, you know, and stand out in the sun. But no, you can never come back here. And he was only eight. So he became uh, one of the children of the streets in Colombia. And they're called gamines. And these kids are different than your regular homeless kids. These are the ones that they've got some kind of criminal smarts. They get into trouble. They're very violent. They're rebellious, that kind of thing. He eventually joined a gang in the area and he 
uh, became a habitual smoker of what's called basuko, which is an impure form of cocaine. And keep in mind, he's like 10. And he comes across this kind old man, he thought, who offered him food and a bed and a place to sleep. He believed him because he was young. And instead, the old man took him to an abandoned building and sodomized him repeatedly. Then he came across the woman in the Jeep, the American woman in the Jeep who offered to take him to an orphan school. So he enrolled there. But then he claimed uh, when he was 12 that the teacher molested him. So he broke into the office, stole some cash, and ran away again. So here he is. He's out on the street. Um, and he learns how to steal cars. And he becomes very, very good at it. So he finally gets caught with that. And he was arrested when he was 21. Um, some reports say he was 18. And as a new inmate, um, he was gang ard by four other inmates. But Lopez made a shank. And he said he remembered all of their faces. So he started to hunt them down in the prison. And he killed them one by one. He got three out of the four. The fourth ran away. And he only got two additional years for that. So he got seven years for stealing the cars, um, the theft, and then these additional murders. But upon his release is when his rampage and his killing spree really began. He found his way out to, um, first he started in Peru, where what he said he would do, he would lure little girls who are between the ages of eight and 12 by promising them things. In fact, he gave an interview and he explained it. He said, I would walk them on the markets looking for a girl with a certain look on her face, a look of innocence and beauty. She would be working with her mother and I would follow them sometimes two or three days and wait for a moment when the mother left her alone. I'd go up to the girl and give her a small mirror and tell her I have presents for her mom too and that we would go to a store and pick it up as a surprise for her. And that's how he was able to lure these girls. Well, what happened was he tried to abduct a little girl, but the mom saw and the mom starts screaming. And it was in a, a native village, like there were, it was indigenous village and there were tribal folk. So they caught him and they were going to execute him. Um, so they dug a hole, they put him in the hole, they tortured him for a little bit and they were going to pour honey on him and let the ants eat him alive. But American missionaries were there and they intervened and they said, Hey, if you, this was in Peru, I'm sorry. Hey, if you give him to us, we'll take him to the authorities and make sure that he's arrested and tried, blah, blah, blah. Reluctantly, the tribe agreed. So the missionary took him to the Peruvian jail, the police. But believe it or not, they let him go because they didn't want the trouble. He just walked out, even though he tried to abduct a young girl. So then he moved to Ecuador and the killings began again. Girls start missing. And they couldn't figure out, you know, what's what's going on? Where are these girls? They thought these girls were disappearing because they thought they were being sex trafficked. They were being kidnapped and, and that kind of thing. But not quite. That's not what was happening. He would prepare ahead of time. He'd figure out this location where he could take them, prep it out, make sure that it couldn't be seen. But he didn't kill at night and he purposely did not kill at night because he stated he wanted to have enough light 
to see the life leave their eyes. So he only killed during the day. He would do it so slowly and he would strangle them that it would take up to 15 minutes for them to die. And then he would bury like three or four bodies in a grave. He said he was killing up to three girls a week. And then all of a sudden in 1979, there was a flood. And what happened with this flood, it washed up four bodies. Now, this is the woman right here. And that's the little girl he tried to abduct in Peru. Okay. And that's her mom. When this flood happened, these four girls or these four bodies started to wash up. And then they started to notice, wait a minute. This one's wearing this. This one's matching that. These were the four missing girls. And that's when they realized they had a problem. That was the break in the case. This is the area where he was killing. And the flood happened in Ambato, Ecuador. So there was suspicions around him. And they put an undercover captain with him in his cell because there wasn't really enough. And this police captain got him to start trusting him after just a few days. And then what ended up happening was he started telling this police captain, hey, I did this and this and this. I hid them here, here, and here, not knowing he's talking to an undercover cop. That's the evidence that they used against him. So he ended up taking them to where 53 girls' bodies were. And all of these girls were between the ages of 8 and 12. Following that horrific discovery, he then took them to 28 other sites. The problem was... There was a lack of human remains because the animals were taking them. The graves weren't deep enough. And so they carried away what was left. He was tried in Ecuador and he was found guilty. The problem was Ecuador does not have a death penalty. And at the time, the maximum sentence allowed under Ecuadorian law was 16 years. He only got 16 years. And so what ended up happening was after he served his time, his 16 years, because he pled guilty to 110 counts of murder. Well, he spent 14. He did 14 years in. And then on August 31st, 1994, he was released from the Garcia Moreno prison. Now, here's a little tidbit that I found disgusting. He wasn't housed in the men's unit. He was housed in the women's unit. And their excuse for that was that he liked little girls, so the women will be safe around him. That doesn't even sound right. Right? But, hey, you know, Ecuador. So this is the women's prison. And uh, that's him. And he only had two guards. Yeah, a prolific serial killer. That's what they did. So they released him after 14 years. He served 14 years and he got out two years early for good behavior. He was summarily deported, rearrested one hour later, and summarily deported to Colombia because he did not have a visa for Ecuador. And when he got to Colombia, they charged him with a, a two murders from like two decades before. Instead, what ended up happening was he was declared insane. So in 1995, he was put in a Colombian psychiatric facility. You would think, okay, yeah, this guy's a psycho because he gives this interview while he was in prison to an American journalist named Ron Leitner. And before he would agree to talk, he said, yeah, I'll give you an interview. I'll tell you all about my crimes. But you have to bring the prison director's daughter here. 
and let me touch her because I haven't touched a woman in years. So she did. And that's the director's daughter. And that's him, creepy man on the right. Well, he gives this interview and he finally tells the Mr. Leitner that, hey, I've killed over 300 girls. They're all over the place. I just, I'll never stop. They print this story. It's all over the news, all around the world. He was very lucid, made complete sense, uh, very aware of what he was doing. Nothing insane about it. But I guess I was thinking they would just lock away the key. No, no, no. That's not what happened. In February 1998, they declared him sane. And they he walked out of prison. He was released on $50 bond. You mean from the psychiatric hospital? $50. And he's just released. Now, here's the problem. He hasn't been seen since. He could still theoretically be out there. Now, all these pictures these from are that just... area, because he's got guys on there, too. No, um, yeah, the... these, yeah, just the little ones, not the the adult men, but it's just the little ones that are in this one. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I just was asking because I was like, I know you said that he, he mm -hmm. killed three out of the four guys in he prison. Did. He probably mm -hmm. killed a lot more in prison. He, yeah, and, or, or even outside of that when he was in a gang. He claimed that his first murder occurred when he was 18. He, or he also claimed that it could be as high as 350, 350. He just stopped counting and lost track. What's so sadistic about this POS, this piece of shit, is... He wasn't stupid. He was very methodical. It wasn't like he just threw it together, you know, and and killed at random chance. His attitude towards his victims is very, very telling. Um, and it's actually very common with a lot of serial killers. He considered these victims his companions. He would keep several bodies in one place and then have tea parties with all of them together. He said that he had to bury three or four in the same grave so that they wouldn't be alone and that they were his friends only were that when they were dead. Um, and that's because he could exercise complete control. He not only defiled them while they were alive, he also did it after death. Ron Leitner stated that in the interview, while he was interviewing him, Lopez was, you could tell by his gaze, he was reliving it. And he enjoyed and he made sure to emphasize how he only killed during the day so he could watch the spark leave the eyes of an innocent victim. And he also asserted he would feel that moment again if he was ever released. So the fact that they released him on a $50 bond, he's suddenly sane after two years was, it was to me a failure. They didn't want to deal with it. You know, now I will say since then, um, because of Lopez, the Ecuadorian government changed the length of time that for their maximum sentence, but they still don't allow the, the death penalty, whereas Colombia did. And so Lopez was afraid he was going to be deported and, and tried in Colombia because they would do death by firing squad. So no one's seen or heard from him. But I wonder if someone... Didn't take him out? Yeah. i just been thinking that. I, I honestly have been thinking that. Uh, there are four different types of serial killers. Okay. All right. And I think he's either a lust killer or he's a thrill killer. I think it's more lust, but I'll, I'll give you all of them. Yeah. Uh, so visionary killer, psychotic okay. and disorganized, suffers from delusions and hallucinations. 
picks random targets and lacks planning, believes he's mm-hmm. being That's he or she is being commanded or killed to kill little or no effort to cover crimes doesn't fall in that suit next mm-hmm. one's mission killer which is organized plans his crimes does not suffer from psychosis uh target specific group of people quick kills quickly and effectively typically avoids close contact not him this not one him. here is the one i feel uh he uh are and tortures mm-hmm mutilates because it gives him sexual gratification yeah. fantasizes about violence can find it difficult to control his impulses uh prefers close contact will use a knife for his hands instead of a gun mm-hmm. and you got a thrill killer which uh, the act of murdering someone excites them mm-hmm. enjoys the hunt and gets off mm-hmm. on the victim's terror often feels inadequate or powerless loses interest with the victim after death that's him and that's what I said. It's either one of the, there's some in that, that lust that I could see, yeah. but there's also that thrill killer. That's why I said he bounces between these two things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think, I think it could be a mix of both, but I think you're right. I think he's more of a lust serial killer. I would not be surprised if he got caught trying to do it again, because here's the thing. Serial killers never stop killing. And I, I, he is clearly a psychopath because he doesn't care or have any sympathy for his victims. He has no remorse or guilt over his crimes. He never expressed any remorse or guilt. In fact, it was the opposite. He was angry at how he was being treated. I'm going to find this quote in his interview. He said, I'm being tr- I'm being treated badly here talking about while he was uh, in prison in Ecuador. Guards look at me through the bars. Sometimes they show me a knife and say they will come in at night and mutilate my body. I'm not getting exercise, sunlight or fresh air, and this is all wrong for I am the man of the century. I will be famous in history. That's not remorse. There's no guilt and that's not psychosis. I can't I don't want to say that he didn't have a chance. I'm saying that from birth, he was set for failure. He just, I wonder, are you born this depraved? I, uh, it just makes me think like, you know, um, the kids that grow up killing animals at first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were they born that way? And I think the real answer is, is, yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, it's something that I think goes through the mind. And I do want to correct something that I said about the uh, the lust and the um, thrill. Uh, hedronistic, hedron, hedronistic, hedronistic, yeah, is commits acts for their own personal pleasure. And that's. Mm-hmm. That's where those fall under, and then power control. That's what the FBI has on here. I flipped okay. over, and so those are the other two. So really, there's four, but mm-hmm. they fall underneath those four, and not so much the lust and thrill. They just all combine together. Uh, there's this disgusting and depravity, and then there's Pedro Alonso Lopez, and what f- just angers me. Is he wasn't stopped before? He wasn't stopped before. And there was all this opportunity too. And they, when they caught him in Peru, when they caught him in Peru, they could have saved over 200 lives. But they let him go, even though he attempted to abduct a young girl. I just, and I get it, it's South America, but when it comes to children governments regardless of the time should have done everything to protect them and they let this they basically gave him a get out of jail free card to kill well i was thinking is and i've seen it on many different planes of the field i'm just Mm going to say that from different cultures Right. Have different ways. And some we might say, well, they're not being smart enough. Mm-hmm. Some of them just don't know. Mm-hmm. 
Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, they were put in this job position to guard or to be a police officer, but no one knew how to be a detective. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? So I agree with what you're saying and I hear what you're saying. I, I think more, and I'm not saying a third world country or South America or, you know, us right. or it is wrong. It's just that we learn from a different type of playing field than other people. Country. Or other yeah, countries. that's true. And so I just want to say, I want to give them that also along with what you're saying. Yeah. And, you know, and it was a different time. I do know, understand Ignorance that. is bliss. Right. But sometimes it's not ignorance. It's just you not wanting to know the answer or go and look for the answer. Right. He'd be 75 years old today. But the thing is, is the fact that no one's found his body. No one. Uh, he was never seen again. He is he knows how to hide amongst uh, the homeless and, and vagrants. That's how he was able to lure them and mix in with them. I know like um, doing different missions over in South America and Panama, people disappear all the time. Yeah. They disappear in weird ways. I'll just put it like that. And the seventies was a very, very, tumultuous time in south american especially history especially for guerrilla warfare yes yeah, but i agree especially down towards panama and the handle going all the way down in south america mm -hmm. like uh you would be handed off to different groups mm -hmm. and they would have your guides and stuff like that so i think possibly you know Splash the, pol the police and the government unfortunately didn't care about missing poor indigenous girls because exactly. there was a war going on at the time what's dangerous is the fact that his body hasn't been found he hasn't been seen since and we all know that serial killers never stop killing psychopaths don't wake up one day and say oh i'm done that's just not how it works so if he is alive whether he's 75 or 85 or even 95 he is still dangerous and he has an mo and he has a taste for innocence. So that's why I think he is one of the worst of the worst. If not the worst. Wow. I, I all in all, I think this was a good one. Like, honestly, I, I, you know how I am. I usually try to pick things apart, but I'm just kind of distraught because, you know, being in those, those three areas and, uh, yeah, I could have come across them at any time. People who intentionally target children, I think there is a special place in hell for them. And if this guy isn't burning there now, he will be. So that's the end of chapter one. Stay safe. Be nice to each other. Don't kick your dog. Don't drink and drive. And at the, the most important th thing that you need to remember is drink water. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. That's an army thing. Thank you for the safety weekend safety brief right there. You're welcome. And Don't go until... robbing banks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just because they can be thrown out of the second story window doesn't mean they're actually going to die. And on that note, we'll <laughs> spoke at you later.